You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Hello and welcome to our second edition of This Week in Space, powered by Space Flight Now. I'm Miles O'Brien. And as the flying nun would say, you like us, you like us. We are feeling the love here at Twist after our premiere show in the waning day of the aughts. We ought to share some of the laurels and a few darts with you. We shall, once we get into orbit. So for now, let's light the candle. Of course, that is what the space world is hoping the Obama administration will do by the end of this month. Light the candle on NASA's next chapter in piloted space exploration. Now, if someone tells you they know what the White House is going to do, they're probably lying. Unless that someone happens to be the president, the president's science advisor, or NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden. We do know this. The president will deliver his State of the Union address and then roll out his budget by the first week in February. Surely we will know something concrete by then. Safe to say Obama is going to sanction more international partnerships in space, a greater role for the private sector to build rockets, and a mandate that NASA push the exploration envelope. So where does that leave your favorite space vehicle? Well, if it happens to be the shuttle headed for the Smithsonian, don't hold your breath for a reprieve for the orbiters. If you're a fan of the Constellation Plan, Ares 1, a trip back to the moon, you have some friends in Congress. Late last year, Alabama Senator Richard Shelby engineered a rules change that requires congressional approval of any big change to human exploration plans. As Keith Jackson might say, whoa, Nellie, we have a Donnybrook here. So stay tuned. It will be a sad, nostalgic year for the space shuttle team. Every milestone toward launch will also be one more step toward the end of an era. Take this site, for example. That's the shuttle Endeavour headed out to launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center last week. She's currently undergoing final preps for launch on a mission to deliver and install Tranquility, the third and final node of the space station. But all is not tranquil for this station component. The ammonia lines that connect Tranquility to the station cooling system failed a pressurization test. Apparently, it's a fundamental design flaw. One team is working on a redesign that will be sent up to the station later. But for now, engineers are welding together some shorter hoses in an effort to jury rig a fix. Launch is targeted for February 7th, but don't write that one in pen. In the meantime, crews moved the big external fuel tank that will power Discovery into orbit in March into the vehicle assembly building, where it will be mated with the solid rocket boosters and the orbiter. And Discovery's crew was at the Cape this week for what's called the Crew Equipment Interface Test. It's the last time they can lay their hands on some flight hardware before they head off on their supply run to the station. The Tranquility node will offer station keepers the best view of Earth from inside the outpost by far. It has a large cupola with a big 80 centimeter, 31 inch porthole surrounded by a half dozen trapezoid windows. Built by the European Space Agency, this room with a view will also serve as a control tower for robot arm operations, and it will have a special plaque somewhere in the mullions. On it, some moon rocks collected by Neil Armstrong on July 20th, 1969, and carried to the top of Mount Everest by former astronaut Scott Parazinski on May 20th, 2009. Now, Parazinski gave the moon rocks with a piece of Everest to Commander George Zamka in Houston on January 6th. Suffice to say, Zamka, they call him Zambo, is an overqualified rock courier. Meanwhile, up on the ISS, NASA's Russian comrades stepped into their Orland spacesuits and ventured outside the pier's airlock for a spacewalk on Thursday. Oleg Kotov and Max Zarayev prepped the new airlock and docking port called Poisk. Poisk means search in Russian, or as we say in English, Google. Poisk will be a parking spot for Soyuz spacecraft that serve as a ferry to and from Earth and a lifeboat if they have a bad day up there. Zarayev and astronaut Jeff Williams plan to try the new port on for size next week. They will move a Soyuz from the Zvezda service module to Poisk. Don't forget to feed the meter, boys. Meanwhile, deep in the heart of Texas, a big step on the road to sending privately built spacecraft to the space station. Space Exploration Technologies, or SpaceX, ran a full duration test of the second stage for its Falcon 9 rocket. Looks good to me. Lots of noise, fire and smoke. And the company confirms the motor did pass the test. Now they can start packing it up and shipping it off to Cape Canaveral. 
SpaceX founder Elon Musk says the test launch will happen there one to three months after the motor is delivered. The company has a $1.5 billion NASA contract to build a spacecraft that can deliver cargo to the station. Sort of takes the Fed out of FedEx, I suppose. Whether they carry a badge signed by Charlie Bolden or Elon Musk, rocket scientists are genetically hardwired to obsess about the future. And in the course of turning their visions into reality, they often forget the importance of history. Such was the case when they lost those high-quality tapes of the Apollo 11 moonwalk. How the heck did that happen? Well, there was almost another historical tragedy involving yet another moon mission, but the day was saved thanks to an unlikely team working in an unlikely place. The old McDonald's at NASA's Ames Research Center in California doesn't have any golden arches. Yet there is gold inside, a pirate's treasure. But mining it is hard. This is what it sounds like when they hit the pay dirt. The date is 29 November 1966. And the spacecraft is the Lunar Orbiter, sent to the moon by NASA as a robotic scout for the Apollo moonwalkers. The first spacecraft to capture a picture like this, Earthrise. We have sub-kilometer resolution on an image taken in 1966 with 240,000 miles away. Keith Cowing is a former space agency scientist who now runs the internet site NASA Watch. He and his matey on this rogue project, NASA contractor Dennis Wingo, had heard about the orphan tapes for years, part of internet lore. And then in 2007, they stumbled on the missing link the old Ampex FR-900 tape drives. They were sitting in a barn owned by retired NASA Nancy Evans, who saved the machines when the Jet Propulsion Lab scrapped them. Dennis hopped on a plane. I'm going, wow, cool, uh, these are tape drives, and found out from Nancy that she was the one that led the effort in the early, early years to do this, but hadn't been able to get it going. But no one at NASA believed it could be done. Keith and Dennis took that as a challenge. They rented some trucks, found the tapes in storage, and then started looking for a place to set up shop. Ames was a Navy base and had plenty of abandoned buildings, including the McDonald's. So they moved in with help from some college students. Austin Epps is studying aerospace engineering at San Jose State University. His father was 10 when Lunar Orbiter took this image. You know, you learn about things that probably nobody's used in decades. It's, it's really cool. But the secret sauce to this project is this man, Ken Zinn, who has 40 years experience working on these machines in military and civilian jobs. Every time you run these machines, the heads have to be adjusted and have to be refurbished. And there's a lot of t tender loving care that goes into it. Keith and Dennis started this project out of pocket, yeah. then cobbled together some funding, just shy of a million dollars. NASA had estimated it would cost $5 million just to build some new machines to play the tapes. I'm kind of glad that I didn't really understand the whole ramifications of uh, what really had to be done, or I might not have been as optimistic. So what's next for the McMooners? Well, they would support a new trip to the moon. Quick as you can say, two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Now that's a reference to Carbon Dates Me. For you kids, that was the Mickey D's jingle about 35 years ago, right after you deserve a break today. Both beat I'm loving it hands down, if you ask me. Now space fans the world over will love this if it should come to pass. Remember Mars Phoenix? Could it rise from the ashes, or perhaps more accurately, from a Dr. Zhivago-like glaze of dry ice? NASA last heard from the Phoenix in November of 2008. The craft landed near the Martian North Pole about five months prior, logged a successful mission, and then died at the onset of winter. Or did it? Now that it is spring, one of NASA's orbiters will listen to see if Phoenix is transmitting. Who knows? We may hear yet again from the first spacecraft ever to tweet. Coming up, the Hubble Hugger in Chief. Astronaut and astronomer John Grunsfeld broke out his tools and tinkered with the Hubble Space Telescope on not one, not two, but three, count them three, different servicing missions. No one knows Hubble like this guy. Now he's hanging up his spacesuit, but he's not going very far. Stay with us for that.